Cochrane High School acknowledges Treaty 7 territory, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Gaina, Pikani, and Siksiga, as well as the Tsutsina First Nation and Stony Nakoda First Nation. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whose first footsteps have marked these lands for generations. We are grateful for traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today, and those who have gone before us. We recognize the land as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on and are visiting. Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us commands. Car ton bras s'est porté l'épée, il s'est porté la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Please be seated. The hostilities of the First World War ceased on November 11, 1918. This armistice brought relief to the whole world. Never before had there been such a conflict. The following year marked the first observance of a day to remember and honor those who died, as well as give thanks for those sacrifices of those who came back from serving their country. Since then, Canadians have fought in other conflicts, and many have given their lives so that we might enjoy freedom today. They too should be remembered. The conflicts in which we've been involved have touched the lives of Canadians of all ages, all races, and all social classes. Those who returned were forced to live the rest of their lives with the physical and mental scars of war. Those who died did so for their homes and families and friends, for traditions they cherished, and a future they believed in. They gave their lives for Canada and for future generations. By remembering their service and their sacrifice, we recognize the tradition of freedom these many individuals fought to preserve. They believed that their actions in the present would make a significant difference for the future. But it is up to us to ensure that their dream of peace is realized. Across Canada and in many other countries, People gather on Remembrance Day to acknowledge the courage and sacrifice of those who served their country and acknowledge our responsibility to work for the peace they fought to achieve. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly. Scarce heard amid the guns below, we are the dead short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, the poppies grow, in Flanders fields. As is done every year, we have just dedicated a few moments to listen to a recitation of the poem In Flanders Fields by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae. Thank you for that, Willow. It was beautifully read. This same poem is being read at Remembrance Day ceremonies and assemblies today all across Canada. Perhaps you have wondered why it is that we read that poem each year. Why is this considered to be such an essential element in our observance of Remembrance Day? Poetry, indeed all the arts, are a valuable means of both communication and connection. 
Poetry gives an audience the opportunity to practice empathy by connecting with experiences that we will never have and may never truly understand. And for the writer, poetry offers a powerful means of expression. Both World War I and World War II, and indeed likely all wars, moved many to become poets. The horrors faced in those wars comprise some of the most traumatizing sights, sounds, and experiences imaginable. It comes as no surprise, therefore, that ordinary words simply could not do justice to the weight and magnitude of the feelings of the soldiers held within. And so they turned to poetry as a powerful medium for both processing and expressing their thoughts and feelings. Feelings such as those described by Ivor Gurney. Suddenly, into the still air burst thudding and thudding and cold fear possessed me. Or those described by Alan Seeger. I've a rendezvous with death at midnight in some flaming town when spring trips north again this year and I, to my pledged word, am true. I shall not fail that rendezvous. Poetry also served as a way for soldiers to cling to their own sense of humanity, of civility. While many soldiers wrote poems after the war, many were scratching down lines on paper while they sat deep in the trenches. Perhaps poetry provided a brief escape from the horrors of war, conditions that were designed to strip these men of their humanity. And so it is for these reasons, to engage in empathy, to process emotion, and to preserve humanity, that I'll now introduce Alexia Prue to read a second poem for us, a poem that articulates in a way that cannot be done with ordinary prose, the horrors and traumas of war. Dulce et decorum est is written by Wilfred Owen. The title is Latin and is translated to, it is sweet and fitting. At the end of the poem, this line is followed by another Latin phrase, pro patria mori, which translates to, to die for one's country. The lines are taken from a Roman poet who glorified war with those words, it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Owen felt betrayed by his government when writing this poem, and yet he still fought for the rights and freedoms we hold dear today, and in this poem highlights the immense sacrifice that was made by so many. Dolce et decorum est by Wilfred Owen. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed coughing like hags we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod, all went lame, all blind. Drunk with fatigue, deaf to even the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys. An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone was still yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire alarm, dim through misty panes and thick green light as under green sea. I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, gluttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores of innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such hide zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dolce et decorum est, popatria mori. Good morning. My name is Andy Teske, and I have been given the honour of speaking at this virtual ceremony as a veteran of, after serving 24 years in the British Army. I've been an engineer and a paratrooper, and I've had the experience of operations in Northern Ireland and Afghanistan. Whilst I would never profess to have spent a great deal of time on combat operations, nor on operations akin to the First or Second World Wars, 
The memories from any conflict are lasting, and the unpleasantness of things that the majority of serving personnel have seen have a lasting effect. Today, I would like to speak about the traumas of conflict and the lasting effects that are present in more veterans than you would imagine. Once again, COVID has continued to adjust the way we live. And once again, we are here in a virtual remembrance ceremony. But for some, the restrictions will have lasting effect on mental and physical health. This often invisible issue is very real and well discussed in current society under the context of COVID. But for serving personnel, past, present, and in the future, these mental injuries are also very real. Often as we sit together on November the 11th, we talk about wars and conflicts from the past and look at pictures and even video footage and imagine what it must have been like. I'm glad that for many it is only a passing thought represented by the drop of a coin in the poppy collection box and a moment's silence at the 11th hour. COVID may have given many a small insight into the stresses that an enemy, albeit an unseen virus, can cause, and the effects of relentless fear and restrictions of freedom. And these are the conflict, these are the often lasting memories that the conflicts of war generate in veterans. So as we remember today, do not forget to think of the lasting effects on veterans of every service, not just the military, but the police, the firemen and women, the doctors and the nurses, to name a few. But PTSD is not new. It is a new label for the terrible suffering that has been endured by many. It does not just affect them, but their friends and their families as well. It has taken many names over the centuries. In ancient Greece, the warriors were deemed to have hysterical blindness or survivor's guilt. In the American Civil War, it was referred to as soldier's heart. The First World War shell shock and the Second World War war neurosis. And in the Vietnam War, combat stress reaction. And many thought that personnel in or supporting combat operations were simply experiencing combat fatigue. But luckily for many, this issue now has a name. And with that comes wider investigation and treatment that's available. So to help you understand trauma-related mental illness, imagine the mind being like a spring. Events and experiences can cause that spring to change shape, but return, return to normal afterwards. And this is how most will live their lives. For those that we remember today, their experiences have been extreme. The movies may seem real, to those who watch them. But for those who have experienced it, for, and for extended periods of time, there is a very real consequence. The exposure forces their spring to stretch to a point where it may never return to normal. The memories of losing a friend or a fellow soldier, or seeing in full gory detail the effects on innocent bystanders, perhaps even children, will be baggage that some will never be able to put down. Sometimes even being away from family in a dangerous environment with the fear of never returning is enough to cause dilapidating effects to the human mind. From a personal perspective, I was very fortunate never to lose a soldier under my command whilst on operations. But the, the, the stress of deploying and serving in Afghanistan was very real. I have vivid memories of the parades on the tarmac at Kandahar Airport to say farewell to fallen soldiers as they returned home in a coffin, draped with their national flag, never to see their loved ones again. Often early in the morning, the coffin would be loaded onto the C-17, and as the bugle played, the sun would start to rise. And this was the preparation many had for the day ahead, venturing out on dangerous combat or logistic operations. The concerned look on every soldier's face as we left the safety of the base was forever present. And it was often on the orders of the officers that those soldiers would be put in harm's way day after day. I remember on a logistic vehicle convoy, we were saved, saved from ambush by the Apache helicopters supporting us. 
The Hellfire missiles ended the lives of some to preserve those of others. And then there was the missions to help local villagers with their primary health care. And when we were leaving, we closely avoided the Taliban once again, who were waiting in ambush, as a result of the information provided to us by grateful villagers. Each time, we were potentially moments away from the type of fighting that never ends well. Decisions were made every day, and if wrong or ill-considered, would lead to the loss of lives. And for me, that would have been the soldiers in my charge those who I had taken away from their loved ones. As I said, I and my company of men and women were lucky. 280 flew out and 280 flew home safe. Unfortunately, others were not so lucky and many of us had experience of supporting the emergency medical teams where we deployed out to help those not so fortunate. We saw a constant stream of injured personnel arriving back at the base. Even sitting on a helicopter with a wounded soldier, you may never have met. It would seem like it would be easy to disassociate that, but it wasn't. These people would never be the same again. Loss of limbs, bullet and shrapnel wounds, and sometimes even worse, severe brain traumas from the explosions happened with all too common regularity. This preyed on every soldier's mind and made them wonder what would happen tomorrow would they be next? Their spring was stretched daily, and for some, it would never return to normal. Sadly, I learned of a colleague who reached the most senior rank in the Royal Marines. He had deployed on many combat operations and returned safe, only to take his own life in the twilight of his career. We can only imagine the demons he carried around from his military service that caused him such turmoil to leave his family in this way. And sadly, he's not alone. The number of suicides of serving personnel and veterans alike is concerningly high. My daughter Millie wrote a poem last year around Remembrance Day, and I couldn't think of a better way to describe the thoughts and the effects on a veteran. And she wrote, the old man sat on the park bench in silence, his arched back and silver hair revealed his age. He watched the free world pass without a care, but remembered the horrors he once saw. His eyes closed as he tried to forget, but the memories produced such vivid pictures. The thoughts of friends and colleagues would never leave him. It was the burden he carried, but when he returned to the present, he understood what it had all been for the smiles, the freedom of the carefree world that came at the expense of some, but benefited all. In closing, there are two quotes I'd like to leave you with. The first is from Dr. Jason Crowley, an expert on ancient Greece at Manchester Metropolitan University, who said, PTSD results from the interaction of two variables, namely the human being and his or her environment. The environment has a real and lasting effect on service personnel, which is why General MacArthur said, the soldier above all prays for peace, for it is the soldier who must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. So as we sit here today, can I ask that you make a promise to yourself? Do not just sit in silence for one minute every year on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Spare a thought daily for those who have sacrificed, suffered, and who still may continue to suffer. Please listen to them when they need to speak and give them your full attention, no matter how busy you may be. Provide them the comfort by the lack of your judgment or opinion and just listen. What may seem like just another account of the same old story is therapy to those that need it, and it will always be well received Remember not only those, those who have fallen in the service of their countries, but those who remain and still may be suffering, even if in silence. Thank you.
Every year on November the 11th, Canadians pause in a silent moment of remembrance for the many people who have served and continue to serve our country during times of war, conflict, and peace. The hostilities of the First World War ceased on November the 11th, 1918 at 11 a.m., the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. As we pause, we honor those who fought for Canada in the First World War, in the Second World War, and the Korean War, as well as those who have served since. They gave their lives and their futures so that we may live ours in peace. Please stand with me for the last post and remain standing throughout the moment of silence. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. They were young, as you are young. They served, giving freely of themselves. To them we pledge, amid the winds of time, to carry their torch and never forget. We will remember them. <laughs> 